Tonight we're in the departure hall of the cruise terminal at the port of Dover, but we're staying put for question time. Good evening to you at home. Welcome to our audience here and to our panel. And on our panel tonight, the Conservative Cabinet Minister, Ken Clark, Labour's Shadow Education Secretary, Stephen Twigg, the Daily Mail columnist, Melanie Phillips, the leader of the RMT Union, Bob Crow, and the UKIP candidate who beat the Tories in last week's Eastleigh by-election, Diane James. Thank you. Wonderful sound of a ferry just leaving the harbour as we start. Our first question from Danny Rose, please. Is it time we defied Europe and closed our borders and say we're full? Time we closed our borders with Europe and tell people we're full. This is a week when everybody's been piling in. Duncan Smith on the Tories, Ed Miliband apologising for Labour's policy on immigration. Ken Clark. Well, we are trying to cut down the total number of immigration, but not from inside Europe. We uh, took over a situation where about two million people have been added to the population during the term of the previous government, but they're largely coming from around the world. Uh, and we've already got down the sort of influx quite considerably. We've got further to go, really, really not by excluding. We don't want to exclude Tories, we don't exclude foreigners, we don't exclude students. We're certainly not skilled people but having sensible rules and then applying them properly to a level we can afford. As far as Europe's concerned, what we need to do in Europe is actually press on. We're getting the full advantages, economic advantages, as well as the political advantages, out of the single market. And really, the British are pressing in the current drive for reform to open it up further, to extend it further, to really make ourselves a big block in world affairs. To have the, we have the biggest market in the world. Let's make it effective, extend it to more things. And you can't have a single market without having the free movement of people. There are vast numbers... You can't of, say we're full, in other words. Well, there are vast numbers of British people uh, working in Europe. So if we suddenly said to our partners, uh, oh, actually, we're not letting any foreigners come here, but otherwise you're, we're your close business and trading partners, of course, and we expect to have a lot of investment and trade, I think they'd think we'd taken a slightly leave of our senses, in my opinion, put it mildly. Uh, uh, there are rules. People can come here to work. Skilled people are desirable here. The Poles who came here, came here and did work. They claimed far less by way of benefit than the equivalent British people would have done. And they're very, very... So you have no well hesitation about saying, steady as we go, it's fine, there's nothing... As long as you appoint the rules. We, we, you right. can't just come and get benefit. You can't just turn up because you want health service treatment. You do have to be looking for work. Uh, frankly, it's part because uh, our administration is, has over the years been pretty pathetic at enforcing those rules. If we, we have perfectly good and sensible rules, you can tighten them up a bit, other countries will want to. But for heaven's sake, in the time of crisis, and it is a crisis we're in, politically and economically really in the world, the British have suddenly start saying there are selected foreigners who we're not going to allow to come here or we wish to trade more and more with friendly countries, but for heaven's okay. sake, no, 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 we're closing our borders to your people, I think we'll, we really will take a difficult situation very much worse. So, thank you. Uh, so, Diane James, the Tories have got it dead right, and there's nothing uh, more to be done. I couldn't disagree with Ken Moore, and thank you for the question that came from the audience, Danny. I mean, you're, I, I believe you're absolutely spot on, and so does UKIP, which, um, in terms of we have got to admit that enough is enough, We've got to close the door on the open, uncontrolled immigration policy that the EU has in place. Now, you know, Ken's made a whole series of points. I cannot see, and I'm sure no EU country is suddenly going to say, just because we introduce a policy, and it would mean leaving the EU to, to be able to achieve that, that they're suddenly going to throw out all of the pensioners that settled, that bring a very, very good income into their countries, the vast number of very highly skilled and professional people that work in France and Germany. What we are concerned about, and I'm particularly concerned about, and I can draw on numerous anecdotes from last week's uh, result and the campaigning that led up to that, is when you undermine at the lowest level, as in young people, 
wanting their first job and wanting to then work through and aspire and achieve ambition, when you undermine that, then we've got a problem. And that's what the EU policy is allowing to happen at the moment. So is your view that you couldn't get anywhere without leaving the EU? You can't do any of these things until you leave the EU. Is that your point? Yes, it is. Very much so. Okay. You, sir. No. Yeah, I understand um, that the policy that uh, is being proposed is that uh, there would be a necess necessity for someone to have one year's residency in the UK if they were another European national, um, which would then entitle them to NHS services, benefits and so on. I wonder if the panel would like to comment on the possibility where you have a, a large number of people who have been working in other European countries, maybe for two or three years, maybe for four or more, who are British nationalists, uh, na British nationals, they almost, yeah, yeah. Um, British nationals, returning to this country because the, the countries they're, they're working in are not actually very successful at, 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 at this particular right. time, Portugal, Spain and so on. When they come back, are they going to be asked to qualify for All right, I see. I get benefits. your point, whether they can't still count Absolutely, as Absolutely, yeah. Okay, and, and the woman here in the second row. <coughs> I just wanted to come back on um, Ken's point about um, allowing skilled workers into the country. And obviously, there is a place for that, but isn't it time that we um, skilled up our own young people? St and Stephen Twig. Twig. Let me start with that because that's such, an, that's such an important point. It's such an important point. We've failed consistently under governments of both main parties to get enough of our young people to have the high quality skills they need, high quality apprenticeships. That's got to be a top priority. And if we get that right, then we won't need as many highly skilled people from other parts of the but world. Will you be able to stop them coming in is the question. Well, what, what we have to do is have a proper policy on that, and that's why it's vital we have this debate. To answer Danny's actual question, I don't think that we need to close the borders. I do think we need policies that are clearer and firmer than we've had. That's why Yvette Cooper, my colleague, has spoken today about acknowledging mistakes that Labour made when we were in government. We did get some of this wrong, including on European migration, where other countries delayed bringing in the full rights for people to move to those countries. We in 2004 didn't do that. We underestimated the number of people who would come. We got that wrong. We put our hands up and acknowledge it. What we now need is a set of policies for the future that doesn't close the door, but in introduces fairness into the system. One of the ways we get fairness is to have better vocational education. Another is to respond to Diane's point about people being undercut in terms of jobs, employers that aren't paying the minimum wage, employers that are including accommodation costs in the minimum wage. That should not be happening. And that is why we're having people going out and recruiting from other parts of the world and cutting out local workers here. There are real things we need to address and we can do it without closing our borders entirely, which I think is neither realistic nor desirable. The woman in the second row from the back. To come to the lady's point at the front, um, two things. Firstly, I'm a secondary school teacher and I teach a lot of um, European immigrant children. And I want to say that actually the majority of them are really, really hard-working students. They come over and within a, like a year or two, most of them are fluent in English. The second thing I wanted to say was is that we were actually training um, our young people with BTECs and stuff like that. And unfortunately, the current education policy, with this like forced having to do EBACs and humanities and whatever else, and actually devaluing BTECs, means actually we're not training a proportion, right. a large proportion of our students properly. Sticking with the third... not actually helping okay. ourselves. What's your, what's your view on, on closing the shutters and saying we're full? The questioner asked. What's your view of that? Um, I actually, well, I, I like the ability that I can actually move to Europe if I wanted to and work. You like I that? Think that? I think that what we have to do is actually, if we're going to have people moving here, we accept that people are moving here, we have to put the, the things in place to ensure they can be functioning people within our society and let them actually be part okay. of our society. Okay, and, and you over here on the left. I think the main concern in immigration is that people come over here and they work for three months, the company will get them in, they're only contracted to that three months. Once they finish a three-month contract, they're then out there and they claim benefits from that and that company will then bring in another group of people to work and then the people that from the previous three months what are they doing in England they're just claiming benefits they don't go anywhere else and you and think, think there are too many people in definitely, that category do you? definitely and, and the man in the tie on there and then Melanie I'll come to you in, in Dover we've got a lot of um, youth unemployment anyway under 25s just walking around the street doing nothing we've already got plenty of East Europeans who are doing the same do we need any more coming in for Bulgaria and Romania next year we need to, the youth that we've got in this country already need to learn some skills, even if they're low-skilled, and get some low-skilled jobs. We haven't got enough low-skilled jobs for more East Europeans to come in. 
Melanie Phillips. Well, uh, in answer to the question, uh, we can't close the border because we belong to a club, um, one of whose foundational rules is open borders. And, you know, if you don't like the rules of the club, you have to get out of the club. And I personally think that, I mean, I'm very glad that at last we're having this discussion because for a long time immigration was a, you know, a taboo subject. But the proposals that the government is making uh, or suggesting now in a kind of panic to uh, pretend that they are dealing with this problem, such as new rules of residency to qualify for health service or benefits, I don't think that's going to work. Uh, either the EU itself is going to say this is against our rules or our own courts are going to say because of human rights we can't discriminate against people from abroad. I think we should come out of Europe. I've always thought that. I didn't ever think we should go in. I have been absolutely consistent in this view because I always thought this was a political project above all and whatever the economic benefits, and I don't think Britain has got many economic benefits from Europe, I think the essence of a nation is that we should be able to govern ourselves in accordance with our own needs, one of which is to determine our own population number and our own population's needs. We may want to bring in people from abroad. People from abroad often add greatly to the value of the nation, but it should be for us as a sovereign nation to decide what we need, how many people we need to come in, what kind of people. This is a proper debate for us to have. At the moment, we belong to a club which says, oh no, you can't have that debate because you now belong to a club where there are open borders and where these right. rules are no longer yours to make. And I think this is an anti-democratic position. I think the European Union is an anti-democratic project and I believe that Britain should reassert its democratic rights and come out. Bob Crow. Well, I want to distinguish between the European Union and Europe. Uh, my union's policy is quite clear to come out of the European Union and we never want to be in it. But we want to be involved in Europe, working with other groups of workers who we believe is our friends. You see, my view personally is that your nationality is pure an accident of birth. Where you was born is your nationality. And it wasn't too long ago, 45, 50 years ago, that London Transport was going out to the West Indies because there was a shortage of labour for people working on London Underground and London Transport. So it's not an issue about what your nationality is. The issue at the end of the day is that the European Union and not Europe is anti-democratic and the reason why they're opening the borders to allow Bulgarians, Romanians, Polish, it's irrelevant. There's people in this audience tonight who are probably Irish. There's people in there who are <coughs> ex-family of Polish. The reason why they open the borders up for is because the people that's coming to this country are economic migrants who are coming to this country looking for work, but by virtue of the fact they're coming to this country, they're lowering the rates and conditions for those people that are working here. And we should be absolutely clear that a person who wants to come to this country, why are we saying to the likes of Chelsea and Arsenal that your footballers can't come and play for you? Because they're immigrants. They come here because they've got a work permit. And the simple way around it is to say that if you want to come to this country, you have a work permit. You couldn't go to Australia without a work permit. You couldn't go to Cuba without a work permit. So why should people come to Britain without a work permit? But the issue is this at the end of the day. It's about time that we didn't wait for Cameron to be elected to get a referendum. We should have a referendum now to decide whether we're going to be part of the European Union or not. And my view is that we should come out. Well, I, I didn't, didn't realise we were, we were three to two in favour of pulling out. Ken Clark, you better have a... What, yeah, sure. Can, well, can you reply on the, on the key point that Bob made about people come here to keep wages low? Uh, and therefore undermine uh, well, the, w the working conditions of people already here. Where there are negotiated conditions in the <coughs> railways and where we have a minimum wage, well, that should be stopped. It means perfectly within our power. That's the Europeans don't stop us uh, enforcing contracts and the minimum wage on anybody here of whatever nationality. And what you can't do is discriminate.
uh, nationality and what you can't do is discriminate. When I go to Europe as a tourist or doing my present job, I take a little health card and I get offered health treatment in whatever country I'm in on the same basis as the locals. That is how it works. And, and uh, you know, if you go and work in Europe, if you're a British person, you do acquire, if you stay there, have a long stay, a few years or whenever, you start acquiring rights to benefits. It goes in both ways. And you can't turn to some country and say you're going to stop it without expecting them to say, well, we're going to stop your people coming here. And I, I congratulate the two ladies. They, they, they took us on to skills training, apprenticeship, motivating our young people. Uh, that is the way, and together with all the other things we're doing, capital investment and so on, to give the jobs and to stimulate our economy. At these time out crisis, it's too easy for parties like UKIP to say, no, we can solve youth unemployment, you've got to stop all these Bulgarians coming here. Uh, if you start voting for that kind of protest movement, you take your eye off the ball. I'd right. love to argue the merits of what we're doing. We do have a private sector that's created a million more jobs since we came to power, and we've got to have more of that. We have thousands of Bulgarians here picking vegetables and fruit. They come each year because you can't not, get not, British not, people not, to do also, it. Also, Ken, what have you done about the manufacturing industry in this country? You've shut down coal, you've shut down steel, you've shut down fishery, and there's not one kid that can leave school now without a proper apprenticeship because of the disaster of your policies over the last 30 years. Right, the man there in, in blue, waving, not drowning. Mm. Yeah, um, just to answer the, the, the question that the gentleman said at the back, the question was about, is the country full? Now, on our current trajectory, there's going to be 75 million of us in this little island. There's a real debate, and I, frankly, the, the immigration issue is just for populist cheap shots from UKIP. The real issue is there's far too many people in this country now. If you live down here in the southeast, all the roads are full, all the trains are full. We're crowded. It's the big issue here. The big issue is that there's too many people in this little island. There are too many and, people coming. I quite and, agree. And, that's, no, what we're, that's what we're tackling. No, no, wait, the no, the no, worst no, problem is we need too many three people, more cities. The birth rate is wrong, you mean? Well, oh. I'm, I'm saying that the issue of the debate here should not lapse into this, frankly, mm. populist, cheap shot politics that you get from UKIP. We need three more cities the size of Birmingham by 2050. All right. Now, that and, is a massive issue. All right. And the woman here on the, on the right true. here. I think everybody keeps mentioning the word workers and um, Ken said I think that if, if we work in another European country and mm -hmm. we establish rights after a certain time, I wonder how those benefits compare to the benefits that people get mm -hmm. here, which right. within three months or so is... Okay, and, and you, the One man the sitting on the front here. My worry um, when we talk about an in-out referendum is whether or not the people will get the information that they need oh, to right, make okay. the right choice. The in-out okay. referendum in Scotland is the same facts being twisted by both parties, and that's the worry that I have, that we'll, we'll have enough to make a right choice. Okay. And there is a certain irony that when the Scots announced their referendum, David Cameron said, there's, not, there's too much time being taken, why don't you get on with it? And he's now saying we'll have a referendum, right. but in four years' time. Oh, we may come to a bit, <laughs> of, a bit more Ukipri later on. Uh, I think we'll move on. <laughs> um, it, it, just to say that, it, it, as you know, if you want to join in the debate tonight, there are two ways of doing it. You can either go on Twitter or you can text us. Our hashtag for Twitter is BBCQT. We've got a panellist tonight, uh, the tax expert and campaigner, Richard Murphy, who's on BBC Extra Guest. Uh, or you can text comments 83981 and the red button will tell you what uh, other people are saying. Mark Cheeseman, please. David Cameron advocates austerity. Vince Cable suggests spending. Who is right? Right, and let's keep this one simple if we can. As simple, We've got the budget coming up and the lines are drawn, and clearly the issue is whether we should ease up a bit and get a bit more growth, or whether, as Cameron says, we must stick as we are. Um, and uh, there have been no surprises for what some members of the panel say, but let's start with one of them, um, Stephen Twigg. Well, Plan A clearly isn't working, and however late he's come round to the point of view, it's good to hear Vince Cable saying that, though I think he's had to row back a little bit today. The reality is that in 2012, the UK economy barely grew at all. We are not in a good state as an economy, and that needs to change. And one of the ways that we need to change is to have a real boost to capital spending. We've been arguing for a long time as part of the five-point plan for jobs and growth that we should bring forward capital investment in things like 
like schools and housing. We have a housing shortage in this country. We have a lot of schools that desperately need refurbishment. We have parts of the country where there aren't enough schools. If we brought forward those projects, we would employ construction workers, employ people in the supply chain, create apprenticeships. That would give the kind of boost to the economy that is desperately, desperately needed. What Let's is it of Vince Cable that you agree with? He's basically and of David Cameron that you don't. He's made that point, and we've been making that point consistently through this period. In the New Statesman article today, Vince Cable's making that point. David Cameron's speech today suggests that he's not listening to that point. He's not listening to the concerns being raised by his own cabinet colleague, but more importantly, I think being shared now by a majority of the British people that see that this plan simply isn't creating okay. jobs. Okay, and what, and what chance of the business secretary getting his way when the budget comes, in your opinion? The I wouldn't Democrats bet too much on it. I wouldn't bet too much so, on it because so I think David Cameron and George Osborne are determined to go down this particular route. It's a very sort of ideological uh, objection to spending more public money. But actually, when you're in this kind of economic situation, it makes economic sense to do this in order to get the recovery that we need. Melanie Phillips. An ideological objection to spending more public money. That's quite a, quite a formulation. I mean, this country is in extraordinary difficulties because of its extraordinarily high level of debt. We have as a country lived far, far beyond our means for too long and that's the essence of the problem. So to say that we should spend more is on that basis uh, deeply irresponsible. Except that Vince Cable says interest rates are low, it's a good time to borrow. Well, quite honestly, if you read Vince Cable's um, uh, article in the New Statesman, I mean, it's quite hard to see what actually he is saying. Um, because it's a little bit opaque um, and he doesn't actually say we should be borrowing more. At the end of it he says um, this is a very difficult decision and there are many arguments on both sides. But the fact is that... Um, well he does say the question is whether the government should borrow more at current very low interest yes. rates to finance more capital spending. He says... Such a strategy doesn't undermine the central objective of reducing the deficit. He says that in is other an words, you can borrow he now. He says that is an argument. He, he says it is a question. Well, he's not in favour of it. Well, he, he implies he's in favour of it, but that's, that's the sort of detail. I mean, the fact but is... But that's surely the substance of the thing. What's the Chancellor going to do in the budget? Well, should he listen to this? No. Or should he listen to David Cameron? No, he should not listen to uh, Vince Cable. But on the other hand, I don't think that the government has done what it should be doing. It's talked up, um, you know, uh, cuts as if we are living in an age of tremendous austerity. In fact, all it's cut is the projected rate of increase in spending. It hasn't actually cut spending. And at the same time, we have this problem with growth. This is a very complex matter, spending, growth and so on. I think personally, you need to encourage people to, uh, to personally to spend. You need to cut their taxes. And there are ways you can do this. We have crippling amounts of green taxes, which are putting up the cost of fuel, for example, fueling the cost of living tremendously. In my view, this green, whole green uh, agenda is a complete green herring. But, you, um, <laughs> it has, but you'd it have has, a budget, your budget would be a tax-cutting budget. My budget would be a certain taxes would be cut to make people feel more, more wealthy. At the same time, I would cut spending. For example, international development, international aid is costing us some £12 billion a year. We are spending more on international aid than we are on the police. And you'd love. cancel that, would you? I would close down the Department All for right. International Thank Aid. You. Thank you. All right. Man there. You, sir. It's all very simplistic. We need a fairer tax system to tax the wealthier, where the gap between the rich and the poor has never been so wide. And it's about time we have to get into it. Good choice. Bob Crow, as a trade unionist, looking obviously very closely at what the budget might have and what they might do, what effect do you think what Vince Cable has said? Well, I think the budget will be we'll exactly what the budget will be for any Tory Chancellor, to look after the rich at the uh, excuse of the poor. And the fact is the austerity has been used to roll back all the gains that working people have had since World War II. Uh, attacking the National Health Service, attacking comprehensive, comprehensive education, <laughs> building social housing, all of them are under attack. And you've only got to see the figures this week. For example, we was told that uh, when Thatcher was elected, she was giving council houses back for people to buy so people would have the right to their house. 20% now of council houses sold off under Thatcher and they are being run by private landlords. People in the Conservative government, some of them own 40 individual houses, flogging them to people because they've got nowhere else to live. 
But if you look at the policies of both Labour, Liberal and Tories, not the minute policy, they all support privatisation, they all support keeping the anti-trade union laws in place, and they all support illegal wars around the world. The only way you're going to get growth is by getting working people to have more money in their pockets to start spending more of that money. Instead of talking about tax cuts to the rich, what they should be looking at is raising the minimum wage for those people that are at the bottom end will naturally spend that money and rejuvenate the economy. But the biggest thing is to get people back to work. We've got a million builders on the dole claiming social security and not paying tax, and we've got a shortage of social housing. Surely it's about time we get the builders back to work, they pay tax, they don't draw social security, and we give them homes for people to live in, but more importantly, you give dignity and respect to builders and other people. Henry Ford, in the Depression, a capitalist, doubled the wage of all Ford workers in America because he understood that if people had more money, they spent more money, and the economy grew from one industry to another. The disaster of these policies have been is mass unemployment, lowering the wages. And you only see yesterday that Britain now is one of the worst ranked wages in the world. We've dropped about 14th in the world to compare where we were seven or eight years ago. Bob, and it's been you. done on the basis to lower wages and attack working people. Thank you very much. Ken Clark, that's a hefty attack, not just on the Tory governments, but the other parties as well. But what do you make of Vince Cable and the impact of what he said? And maybe you want to comment on what uh, Bob Crow said. Okay, just taking back. Well, firstly, uh, David Cameron, Vince Cable, George Osborne, and the rest of the cabinet, uh, we're all agreed, and Vince clearly agrees, that we've got to get the burden of deficit and debt down. It's still the worst in Europe. And we're spending current spending at a lunatic level. We're steadily at a sensible pace. We're not having to go as fast as some other countries because people have more confidences getting it down. We took over a situation where we were spending five pounds for every four pounds we raised. And actually, one of the last acts of the Labour government was to cut pounds capital spending by about 25 percent, because even they were getting worried about the impact of the, all the money they were spending in other areas. We're now spending more on capital investment than the previous Labour but, government But Bob was says already. you should spend a, a host more and get builders I back bet to There's the one area where Bob and, I, Bob and I ought to be rather closer. We're getting a bit of trouble trying to build a great new high-speed train, Bob, because <laughs> the capital investment has got to be of some economic value yeah, if you're creating Ken, Ken, a modern Ken, 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 economy. Ken, and we're spending, Ken, we are spending a lot on railway you, stations. What hope are you giving to young people? One in 16 to 24-year-olds are on the dole. Yeah, sure. Unless you give kids hope, they're going to wander away. And it's an absolute disgrace no, that no, kids I, are sitting home all day where they could be building those capital projects you talk about. I, I could not agree. That the, reason, the reason I'm still fired up to be in politics is I think it's a tragedy that we've handed a situation where young people, particularly the people leaving school after the credit crunch and after the, the recession, and, uh, are, are coming out and there's nothing for them, and university graduates and so on. The answer is not to reopen coal mines. The answer is not to put up all the social security benefits and start spending money in all direction. The answer is to create a modern competitive economy for which our young people are properly trained and to enable people to get the market. Well, what, the, about, the, what the, about the idea that Vince Cable appeared to be putting and Bob Crow seems to think is a good one as well, of using low interest rates now to borrow and build housing? Because so uh, it, it won't actually knock interest well, we, rates. We, 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 we are disaster. concentrating on housing. We're concentrating again with great difficulty on the planning system, which has to be reformed just as much as you have to make sure that investment goes into the housing system. The the funding to lend the scheme that we've got on with the banks is restoring the mortgage market uh, rapidly. Y you must realise what a tragedy we took over. I I'm quite used to succeeding Labour governments who had left the place in a mess, but never on this scale. Gordon Brown and New Labour were a catastrophe. And all they say is, let's spend a bit more money and let's borrow it. Uh, which is something this country has got to avoid doing for very many years. Okay. It, it's, it's the nitty-gritty of the 40 major infrastructure projects, but also uh, actually keeping our flexible labour market. It's Margaret Thatcher's labour market that means we're still creating jobs even in the present difficulties. Right, we have Ken, a flexible labour market. Have to bring Ken, Ken tells the union. story the way the not, Tories always tell the story that misses out the banking crisis yes. and what had to be done to rescue our economy yes, yes. from the banking crisis. Uh, 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 are you telling me that? We, I think, Stephen, it was. I'm 
forgive me if I'm wrong, it was you but It wasn't who only us, it was an international banking, banking crisis. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, was uh, an international banking crisis. You can't blame Gordon. Uh, I, 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 you can't blame Gordon it Brown. It was not blame Gordon Brown for the American it was banking not, crisis. It was not international at first. It was in Wall Street and it was the City of London. So how are you blaming I, us for Wall Street? If you'd attended the House of Commons, you'd have heard me denouncing the changes in regulation that your lot were making, giving night to the bankers, what George Osborne creating the FSA. It was what I was George saying. George Osborne said that we were over-regulating the banking sector. We, we had, we had, uh, it was bad regulation. It was pathetic said regulation, you didn't right. and, and your government, when we had an obvious cog credit boom, which of course was then followed by a terrible credit crunch, did nothing about it. All, right. All you did was let's, give knighthoods to the most prosperous bank. Right. Let's let's come forward to where we are today. Uh, let me go to the woman here, and then I come to you. Spain and Ireland are two countries in Europe which are awash with empty houses, mm. whole villages, towns. Houses are not the cure-all of the problem that we have. The government is giving the banks so much money that they pay savers and, in particular, pensioners an absolute mm. pittance. We are terrified to spend money. When migrants come into England, we see them. We see them come in through this port, which is the closest port to Europe. They bring everything with them. If they're coming over to be self-employed and start a company, they bring all their machinery, all their goods. They only employ their own. There is companies here which only advertise in Eastern Europe. They won't touch anybody that already lives here. And the wages are lower. Those Europeans that do work here, and it isn't just Europeans, it's also the Asians, they are sending their money home. They do not spend right. it in the UK. Well, we're back and to unless the, we can we're back have to the first some question. spending, we cannot right. grow. No, boom. Thank you. There will we're, be no growth. All right. Uh, uh, D Diane James. Um, uh, bring it back to the question, which was the what appears to be a split between David Cameron and Vince Cable, or some people have interpreted, and which way the government should go now. Okay, well, let's just. I thought I heard the first part of the question was to do with what we could expect from the budget mm. in a couple of weeks' time. I believe I think we're going to get more of the same, and it comes down to the very blinkered approach that George Osborne <laughs> has. Um, or you could say the very obstinate um, approach that he has. He seems absolutely focused, and with David Cameron's support, of going a single route in terms of solving the financial crisis we're in. There appears to be no plan B, and he doesn't see, even seem to be able to contemplate a plan B. And that, I think, is actually much, much more worrying. Um, I hear what Ken says, and, you know, how many times have you people here and other friends and relatives you've had heard this refrain when well, you left us with a mess, Labour? We're three years into a five-year mm, government. To keep on laying the blame yeah. at the previous government is a nonsense. It's an absolute nonsense. <laughs> okay. the, 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 ma the man at the back, in the second row from the back there, that's you, yes. Um, yeah. When our credit rating was downgraded, Moody's actually com complimented the government on, our, on the political will uh, to sort out the financial crisis. And I was saying that to implement the, uh, Vince Cable's ideas of Keynesian economics would simply undermine that, um, that, uh, that plan of austerity. I mean, they commented that the deficit reduction uh, was actually going at a too slow pace. And if you bring in that kind of borrowing now, uh, you'll simply downgrade our rating even more. Vince Cable, when he was on this programme a couple of weeks ago, said that uh, Osborne was a Keynesian. I don't know whether you agree with that. Do you agree with that? No. Bit, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you, not you, don't, you don't agree with Vince Cable on very much. <laughs> oh, I do. Oh, do you? Right, but do on infrastructure things. spending, actually. The, the, the person on the, on the back there on the left. You, you with respect, <laughs> yes. Could it be that neither party has got the right solution, that actually what's needed is tax cuts for working people rather than the wealthy? Because you, the, when this government came in, they, um, one of their first things to do was raise a tax on consumption, and we're a consumer economy, they raised VAT, um, and then they go and cut corporation tax. 
but they haven't done anything about business rates, which mm. destroys people who provide several mm. jobs and get landed with a 10,000 bill. So do you have a party that would do that, do you think? I don't. I, I, I would like to ask um, Crow or UKIP or anybody who would answer that question, because I, I don't know. Well, what, what we do know is there is going to be a tax cut in April, and it's for millionaires, because what the government is doing is cutting the top rate of tax. Now, in a time when we have austerity, a rising gap between rich and poor, as the gentleman said earlier, and yet the only people who are getting a tax cut are millionaires. That has to be a misplaced sense of priorities, doesn't it? All right, it? Let's, let's stick with... <laughs> we'll we'll stick, stick with the current political scene, but take a um, topical question, in a way, from Brian Hall, please, relating to what happened last week. Does the emergence of UKIP at the Eastleigh by-election represent a danger to the Tories at the next election? The UKIP coming second and the Tories coming third at Eastleigh, is this a, a danger to the Tories? And I suppose implicitly, what should they do about it? Um, it's no good asking you, Diane James, whether you think you're a danger to the Tories, because <laughs> presumably you do. Bob Crow, what do you think? <clears throat> well, I think UKIP are a danger to the Tories. I think they uh, are Tories. Uh, and the policies are... <laughs> <laughs> the policies are... <laughs> the policies they promote is for big business. And the fact, as I said earlier on, you know, that the policies of both the New Labour, Liberals, Tories and UKIP are all one of big business, keeping anti-trade union laws in place, emasculating working people so they can't fight, fight, creating mass unemployment, lowering pay. That's what you've had over 35, 40 years of destroying infrastructure in this country. You know, we've got a country here... We're, sorry, with a UKIP was the question. What's going to happen? Well, I don't know what's going to happen with UKIP. It's not me to say what's going to happen with UKIP. I would say that the Tories are being particularly concerned about UKIP. Because uh, you keep are saying, in my view, that are asking people that they should have a referendum now. Why have they got to elect a government which has lost all kind of credibility and at the end of that government, some seven and a half years' time, you will get a referendum? If it's good enough for the Spanish, Irish and other groups of people throughout Europe to have a say on Europe, why can't we have a referendum before we go into the next general election and why we wait another seven years? So if I was the Tories, I'd be extremely concerned about what the damage you keep is doing. The woman there in the second row. UKIP are, re are a really poor excuse for a political party. All they do is focus on the vulnerable people in society and scaremonger them into getting their votes instead of the main three parties. And I think they are, they're disgusting. Hugh Diane James. Uh, uh, can I just go back, please? No, 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 no. <laughs> well, she let's... thinks you're disgusting. You better answer her first okay, and then go um, back. I'd probably need you, if you don't mind, to just define why you're saying disgusting. We've had uh, comments you made... You prey on vulnerable people in society who feel that they're, they're going to be attacked by immigrants coming into our country when there's a lot of positives that immigrants bring to our country and you just prey on the vulnerable. Well, uh, let me... First of all, just go back to our policy on taxation. First of all, no, we're... Please answer her question. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm trying and to get there. Can you do it the other way round and okay. come to the tax? OK. I don't think we are in any... We have got a very, very good policy to encourage young people into work. We also have, have been the only party to identify what is undermining our economy at the moment and what is undermining the employment prospects for young people. What you say is rubbish, though. How are four million... Bulgarians going to come to our country when they've only got a population of seven million people. We That's didn't, absurd. We, excuse That's me, we didn't absurd. Actually, we didn't actually say that. You if, did. I read your party you would, literature in uh, the way that it was. The way that figure came about was a survey conducted in Bulgaria by the Bulgarian government. They identified that 56% of the respondents indicated they would like to leave so the country. So why would you use such? unbalanced data in your publications well, then, when I all it does is scare people into voting for you because they think they don't want migrants in We the didn't use unbalanced data, you we used did. government data produced by the Bulgarian government. If you're no. then casting assertions about the quality of Bulgarian data, I can't comment on that. We merely cited what was in the public domain and we used that in a correct and accurate fashion. But, but, no, you you see, but uh, it's an issue of whether you thought they were all going to come or whether just a large percentage of Bulgarians would rather be living here than in Bulgaria. Well, as I, Slightly different question. As I just exactly. said, you know, the clear you, message David. from the, the survey conducted there was that 56% and 56% of the here. figures... No, 56 Your implication was they were all going to come. Yeah. Well, I don't think that was the implication <laughs> we left with. The, the, we, let, we, made, we drew the conclusion, and it was from the, Bulga from the Bulgarian government data, that that proportion of the population wanted to leave the
that country. And in terms of the proportion of residents that have already left that country, a significant proportion are in Germany and a significant proportion are in UK. So the, and we happen to be, in terms of our benefit system and our entitlement uh, system, the most attractive destination in Europe. And just remember, if you're a Bulgarian or a Romanian at the moment, you might be on a basic weekly wage of a couple of hundred pounds. You will come here and you will double that just in terms of your benefits entitlement. Right. So Stephen a very, very strong case for saying mm. the controls are needed. Stephen Twigg. Look, I think it's really, really important that we have a proper and balanced debate about immigration. I think in the earlier question, we managed to do that. But I do think if we go down a route of a kind of scaremongering and taking a survey and then assuming that everyone who says that they'd rather live somewhere else is then going to come and live here, that doesn't aid a proper, balanced, healthy debate about immigration <laughs> or about Europe. To answer, to answer Brian's question, you know, I think all of us in the uh, main established political parties have to recognise that there is a lot of voter disenchantment. You know, the Tories lost out and slipped to third place in Eastleigh. It was a terrible result for the Tories in Eastleigh. But I don't think any of us can be complacent. People are disillusioned with politics. They want different answers from politicians. And that's why I think all of us, whichever party we're in, have got to engage with legitimate public concerns, whether it's on immigration, whether it's on jobs and the economy, whether it's on the health service. And I hope that that is what we can do. And I respect that UKIP is clearly a serious political party that's engaged in serious debate. But I just going back to my original point, hope that they will not engage in some of the tactics that we heard about from the questioner in the audience. But do you think, think they might let Labour politics. through by, by hurting the Tory vote in enough constituencies at a general election? I'm not going to get into kind of speculation about possible. There's all sorts of different outcomes that could happen. Some Labour people switch to UKIP. Tories switched to UKIP, Lib Dems to UKIP. You know, Lord Ashcroft did some very interesting polling about what people uh, who'd voted in Eastleigh, where they would might vote at a future election. It's very, very hard to know. We've got to win back people to vote Labour who switched away from us in 2005 and 10. A lot of them went to the Lib Dems or the Tories, but some of them now might be tempted to vote UKIP. It's got to be positive. It can't just be negative about another political party. I the front. completely agree with the lady at the back there in that um, UKIP are are just picking up everyone like you say is disenchanted mm. with you politicians and yeah. the fact that I mean none of us believe really that you're connected with society mm. I think that needs to be addressed mm. but I think that scaremongering there are a lot of scared people out there and it's it's going to be a dangerous time come the next election because parties like UKIP who do say some outrageous things um, they're going to capitalize on it and it's very worrying. Melanie Phillips. Well in answer to the question, um, UKIP are a danger to the Tories because of the danger that they will split the Tory vote. But, you know, Mr Cameron uh, has made a tremendous rod for his own back uh, because he scorned UKIP as a party of, what was it, closet racists, loonies and fruitcakes, rather like we've been hearing from members of the audience this evening. And the problem is that since very, very large numbers of people who always used to vote Conservative have the same kind of views about immigration, about the EU, about human rights, about traditional values of one kind or another, Mr Cameron basically insulted his own core vote. He insulted the vast majority of Conservatives. And as a result, Conservatives have felt for years, true Conservatives have felt for years, first of all, totally disenfranchised because their so-called Conservative Party had actually decided it had to become left-wing in order to gain power. And not only did, it become, did they become disenfranchised, but they became subjected to the kind of insults that we've heard from members of the audience, in which people who have a perfectly reasonable point of view that while immigrants are going to add to the greatly to the value of the nation, there, is, there has got to be a limit. You cannot have everyone coming in. That there are genuinely profound reasons why British people might want to re retain democratic control over their government rather than cede it to the EU. These are legitimate points of view. You may disagree. You are welcome to disagree. But to call people scaremongering, racists, disgusting. This is why it is this, it is this vilification of the point of view of ordinary decent people in their millions, which is what Mr. Cameron has managed to achieve. He's managed to tell his core constituency, I don't want you on board because I think you are disgusting. You 
backwoodsmen, you conservatives. I'm going to right. turn this into not the Conservative Party. And look where it's got him, and it serves him right. Thank you, Rowan. So, Cameron has turned on true Conservatives, <laughs> and he's not the Conservative Party. And I, you know, I, the, 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 I suddenly, Melon is assuring me that I'm now in a Conservative Party that is more left-wing. You uh, are. You that, certainly that, that are. It has been for a long time. I'm you may, certainly are. I'm I wish it was, don't you? You uh, are. You that, certainly that, that are. It has been for a long time. You may, certainly are. I wish may, it was, don't you, Ken? I, I, was, I was never regarded as left-wing in the past. I was a mainstream Conservative of 20 years ago. I've served him under four Prime Ministers. I started in politics under Macmillan. I won't go about that. But the idea that the current Labour Conservative Party has swung to the left <laughs> is uh, quite the most... Like, even Bob Crow again would agree with me, I'm sure. <laughs> it is quite the most remarkable thing I've ever heard. We've always had a noisy right wing. There used to be Knights of the Shire. I'm afraid when we were joining the European Union, it was the League of Empire Loyalists that used to turn up and disrupt my meetings. And they used to say we were betraying the country and letting foreigners in and all this kind of thing. But going back to the question, Eastley, uh, when, when, when I was in the Thatcher government, uh, I, that for a time I was junior, I used to be put on by-election specials. And uh, night after night, I, I never had a winner. I, I mean, no, no governing parties gained a seat since the early 1980s. And in midterm, you always have this. Now, the first thing that happened in Eastley was a party of the government actually won and held its seat. We weren't very good at that when we were in office as Conservatives in the 1980s. Uh, and uh, we, we the Liberal both declined. Liberal Democrats, Liberal 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 Democrats won. Yeah. Now, the party, there yeah. was a big protest. Now, I don't dismiss that. I'm not using that word dismissively. But the, the, the people who were Eastley... It didn't vote because of the Bulgarian hordes, apart from the more, more vulnerable uh, ones. So they actually were discontented with the political class, because we had a lot of scandals recently, and they think the parliament has mishandled it, and they blame politicians for the present trouble. And they <coughs> are in a, a, a serious economic problems. Everybody's having but the their living standards. The scandals to be more Liberal Democrat scandals. Well, the, the idea that, I so mean, there's had a sad case today of somebody fiddling his driving points. The idea that somehow that shows the Liberal, the Liberal Democrats are all not to be trusted with their driving licenses or vote Labour, they're better with their driving, their speeding points. It, it's, it's just a personal thing. I think, now, it, it, some of the protests you just anti-protest, and a lot of the voters were people who were not voting at all recently. They've got out of the habit of voting. Now, in Italy, they have Beppe Grillo, and to be fair, if I have to have either Beppe Grillo or uh, the, the Nigel Farage, I'll take Nigel Farage. Uh, he's less of a clown. What about Diane James? About Diane James, certainly, but uh, and not Sylvia Berlusconi either. So they they had a total rejection. Uh, but at the moment, UKIP, which only has policies, which I rather agree with people, are a bit nasty sometimes on Europe and immigration. They have no sensible policy on any other subject. They're the things they headline. Actually are capturing all the people who just are saying a plague on all your houses. And of course we must address that. We must continue to show strong, competent, courageous government and get across to people that it's going to take a long time to get a modern competitive economy and we're reforming this country, we're going to try to reform Europe so that we stand up better in the modern world against all the new changes we've got. A lot of big political challenges in the world as well. Okay. Actually putting UKIP in charge of the Syrian crisis if you uh, put them in government. So people well, are entitled to protest. That? Why do you say that? Well, because people, it's, it isn't what a... What do fancy putting it, them in It charge? isn't a government governing party. These are well, people there yet, are who know what they're against and they don't know what they're for. Oh, they, right. they, they, and, and they know how to... Thank you. Like, Thank you, sir. Uh, I, think, I agree with Melanie. I think um, I disagree with two of the ladies that say um, it, to call politicians disgusting or political groups disgusting. Everybody, it is a democracy and everybody's got that choice and if people want to express their opinion, that's what makes us a democracy. But Bob Crow's absolutely right. What we need is action and less of the politics, less of the rhetoric. We need jobs for working people and we need better pensions for working people as well. Okay. I'm going to move on because um, we've, 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 we've only got an hour and we've taken three quarters of it. I want to go to this question from Jennifer Maidman, please. Jennifer Maidman. When even senior clergy admit they cannot live according to the religious dogma they promote, is it time for a radical rethink of church teachings on gender, sex and sexuality?
And did, did you catch that one? Yes. The, 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 the question, of course, referring, I suspect, to the, the troubles of the Roman Catholic Church in Scotland and Cardinal O'Brien, uh, but also a whole lot of other scandals of one sort or another. Just repeat it for you, Melanie. When even senior clergy admit they cannot live according to the dogma they promote, is it time for a radical rethink of church teachings on gender and sex and sexuality? Your go. Well, if, it's, if the question is referring to the difficulties of the Catholic Church and Cardinal O'Brien and so on, and the, you know, the many scandals in the Catholic Church about uh, paedophile priests, um, I think there is a fundamental problem that the Catholic Church has, which it's, is its repudiation of human sexuality. Um, it's a complete ban on married priests. Uh, personally, I think this is, I mean, I'm, I'm not a Catholic, I'm a Jew. Um, and the Jewish religion puts an enormous uh, priority on marriage and children. Um, and so that's my perspective. But I do think there is something very unnatural about expecting human beings to live in a state of chastity um, without uh, wives um, uh, and, and, and children. And while that can't entirely explain the phenomenon of uh, paedophile priests, um, I think it's a very significant, uh, a, a very significant part of it. Um, I do think it's a crisis for the Catholic Church. Um, I, I'm not somebody who thinks that churches have to, you know, run with the secular tide, adapt themselves to changing social mores, because churches are different. There's no reason why churches who, which, which adhere to religious precepts. Uh, should take on board what are secular social attitudes. So I would defend churches if they wish to have a very traditional, socially conservative point of view. But I do think there's a point at which if you deny human nature um, and you make it impossible to be a full human being and you expect people to kind of sublimate um, what is a natural uh, state of affairs, uh, then you are asking for trouble. Um, and I think that the church, um, you know, for many years has uh, covered this up. I mean, I think one of the things that's so shocking to us all, isn't it, is not that this phenomenon, not just this phenomenon is happening, but for so many years it has been covered up. Um, and uh, even today it is being covered up. And I think that's what's so shocking, the cover-ups, the hypocrisy. And of course with Cardinal O'Brien, he was actually constantly attacking homosexuality, uh, captives of sexual aberration he said, of homosexuals. Yes. So, um, Stephen Twigg. Um, I'm not religious, and I was brought up in a not religious family, and so I always tread with great care when questions like this come up, partly for some of the reasons that Melanie has given. I think politicians, even if they are of, uh, of particular faith, have to tread uh, with care. That said, I think uh, there is a clear mismatch between the things that he was saying and the things that he was doing, and I think that raises legitimate concerns for public debate. I think religion, religions have an absolute right to have their own philosophy, their own teachings. However, the reality is that in most religions there's actually a debate about this. And whilst I don't think there's an obligation to match some development of secular thinking, in reality uh, religions are made up of people who are their followers and those debates do happen. And so there is a debate amongst Catholics, there is a debate amongst Anglicans, amongst other Christians, amongst Jews as well and Muslims about a lot of these questions. And personally, I think the more that we can get to a position where those within religious faiths who are arguing for principles of equality and justice and proper human treatment, that better that will be for society. And I think, frankly, the better that will be for religions. And in particular, in this country, we have an established religion, so I'd like to see the Church of England doing that by making progress in terms of women bishops and the church's attitude to lesbians and gay men. Okay. You, sir. Can, I just correct, uh, can I just correct Melanie? The Catholic Church doesn't stop married priests. In my parish, we have a married priest. I'm a Catholic. But these and are it, Anglicans who've, yeah, who've, yes, who've yes, gone over there, to the But also, there yeah. is a, a sect of the Catholic Church which does allow mm. married priests. So you get your facts right. right. But can I also point out that it isn't just the Catholic Church that has had all these problems. Mm. And I think it's important that we recognise that the Catholic Church is trying very hard to overcome the problems. In fact, in my own parish, we have a very strong and rigorously applied child protection policy. Everyone who has any dealings 
um, with children or in, in respect to POVA, for protection of vulnerable adults, has to go through all the checks and is monitored. So the church is trying very hard. Um, I think there's something coming up now with the conclave in Rome where if the right person is appointed, then we could see quite a few changes in the church, and I hope we do. Okay, thank you very much. Bob Crow. <clears throat> well, personally, I'm, a, I'm a, an atheist myself, and uh, but I respect uh, people's religion and the great work uh, that religious people do, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. I couldn't care less people who are in the Catholic faith, Jewish faith, Muslim faith, surely. Mm -hmm. It's on the basis of uh, their religion of love, looking after their neighbour and not doing harm to one other than they would do themselves. But the fact is you can't say that because there's been a few bad eggs in one particular religion that the old religion's rotten. And that's what we've got. Are we saying now that because of the Savile row, row that all BBC are rotten or because of the phone hacking row, row that all newspaper journalists are rotten and equally said about religion as well. I think uh, we should respect people if they are religious, respect the great work they do and not be drawn down for the vast, vast thousands of people in the religious world that do fantastic work on behalf of the community. Yes, person on the side there. That's you. What I think makes it worse, really, is that um, it seems to be the first instinct of the Cardinal and other people is to deny it. Mm. And then in a few mm. days' time they went, oh, well, yes, all right, actually I did. Mm. Now, surely it would be better to just come clean straight away and say, I'm sorry, put your hand up, I did wrong. Uh, it makes them look so shallow if they deny everything yeah. to start with and then in a few days' time because they think, oh, well, it's all going to come out anyway, therefore I, I'd better now say, yes, I did it. OK. Uh, Diane James. I just feel very, very sad for both the Ang Anglican and Catholic Church. There is this battleground developing over and over again between the traditionalists and the modernizers. I wish that battle wasn't underway. I wish these sort of scandals uh, weren't happening. And when you look at this aspect or put it in the context of declining church numbers, that's not helping what are, is you know, a key pillar, no matter what the faith is, but it's a key p pillar of what holds a good society together. So I just look at it and just feel very, very sad. I agree entirely, actually, with the point you're making. Why does it, ha you know, has, why does it have to be drawn out in the, in the way it was, particularly you know, with the, the Catholic Cardinal in Scotland? But I just feel for him and I feel for anybody who's involved in this, as I say, battle at the moment. It's unnecessary and I would rather see something move on. Surely it's better Ken to be honest, isn't it? Ken Clark. Well, uh, obviously, I think we're all tolerant of religions and they must, uh, they're all, everybody's entitled to choose their, how conservative or liberal they are on, on these uh, kind of things. Uh, and I, I really don't think uh, you know, one should lay it down. I, I personally think uh, all the great religions have to decide how far they have religious precepts, which they really must stick to because they're holy writ or some equivalent, how much they must make sure they're not just stuck in cultural norms of some time ago, which they've acquired over the years, which they must change. And actually, in differing ways, I think, uh, you know, the Catholics and the Anglicans, with their problem over women priests, and the Muslims certainly, uh, do have problems over the role of women. How much, it, what is, you know, God-given, but what actually is just perhaps these attitudes we should and a way of going on we shouldn't have. Even ultra-Orthodox Jews, you've got to be very Orthodox nowadays to have a married woman shave her head off and put a wig on and all this kind of thing. Uh, and, and all of those religions, plenty of Catholics, Muslims, Anglicans and Jews are capable of having an intelligent discussion about what does our religion require, what actually should we change in the modern world. Uh, time's up, I'm afraid. Um, Time's up. We, we, our plans are to be in Cardiff next week. We've got Francis Maud for the Tories on the panel, Chukurumuna for Labour, and Theo Pafitis, the businessman. Uh, the week after that, we're going to be in York. That's the day after the budget. Now, to come to either programme, the best way to do it is to apply on our website. The address is there on the screen. Or if you prefer to call, you can ring 0330 uh, My thanks to our panel, to all of you who came here to the Port of Dover tonight. And um, until next Thursday from Question Time, good night.
There's more discussion next here tonight on BBC One. Violinist Nigel Kennedy and the Cheeky Girls join Andrew Neil for this week.